five years ago, I was uh, in Sardinia uh, on a Jeep safari to a place called Velasimios, where I proposed to my now ex-partner. Um, whilst that didn't quite go according to plan, there was a piece of advice that I picked up from the guy who took us on that Jeep safari. Um, he was quite possibly the happiest person I've ever met in my life, and I just had to find out why. So I asked him, I said, why is it? Why are you so happy? And he said, I've taken something that I love and I've turned it into my job. He said, do that. He said, and you'll be just as happy as me. So a few years later, I set up HM Pasties uh, with support of a local charity called Groundwork. HM Pasties is a, uh, we're a social enterprise. We're a, a bakery, a mobile caterer, and a sandwich shop. And we exclusively employ people with criminal convictions. Now, I guess most of us probably know someone who's been in trouble with the police at some point, uh, maybe ended up in prison. But have you ever wondered what led them to, to be there or to be in that position or to down that path of getting in trouble with the police? Well, um, I've met probably about a thousand people now since 2011, all of them in, in prison, men and women. And I can say without exception that they all have got a couple factors in common. And I can sum those factors all up in two words. And those two words are childhood trauma. Now, the prison population or the prison demographic supports my view. And when you look at how it's broken down, 76% of men in prison all had an absent father. 41% um, all experienced domestic violence in the home. 29% have been victims of abuse themselves. 13% have experienced death of a sibling or a parent as a child. And from my experience in prison, people have, are in there through, as I say, childhood trauma. Now, when you experience trauma as a child, it can manifest itself in any number of ways. Um, what um, I see and what I've experienced is things like um, mistrusting of adults. So you have young people, say the age of 13 to 18, having issues in school usually quite volatile, quite aggressive, uh, displaying aggressive behaviour, usually towards authority figures. Then they end up in damaging relationships, self-harming, thoughts of suicide, and then before you know it, drink, alcohol, substance use, substance misuse and things like that. Now, I guess the easiest way really to explain how that can, can cause problems in the life of a person really is to tell you a bit about myself. Now, I'm a uh, a care leaver, a former uh, young offender, um, but I'm also a, a survivor of uh, childhood sexual abuse. And I guess pretty much any type of abuse you could imagine at the hands of, uh, of my foster parents. And that was my life from well, my earliest memories until I was 14 years old and I built up the courage to, to run away. And I'm very pleased to say that I end up with an amazing um, set of foster parents. And that is what is well known as the earliest point of recovery. So at 14, this is the first time in my life I felt safe. So the damage, the damage stopped and the healing could begin. But the problem was there had been an awful lot of damage that had already been done. So I needed to work that through. I need to work it out. But like most men, I didn't. I didn't do anything about it. I couldn't, couldn't talk about it. Um, so I went around really wanting the world to pay for what happened. And for a couple of years, I did just that, um, out committing seriously violent crimes. And, you know, at the age of 17, I'd destroyed my foster placement. I was put into a flat on my own. I was uh, stealing to eat, then stealing to drink. And before you know it, nine months after being in my own flat, I was in prison for a, a string of violent offences. And didn't really learn much from that got out of prison, decided to move to Manchester. Well, Salford actually moved to Lower Broughton of all places to get myself out of trouble and to put my past behind me. Needless to say, that didn't work. Uh, nine months later, I was looking at another lengthy prison sentence. I got 18 months the first time. This time I was looking at three to five years because my offending had got more serious. Um, the, le the level of anger in me, it didn't go away. And the more people said to me, you've got an anger management problem, Strangely, that just made me more angry. Um, 
And it wasn't until I sat with my barrister, of all people, at the age of 19, looking at, as I say, three to five years in HMP Manchester, beautiful place that it is. Um, and my barrister said, why on earth are you doing this? He said, you're an intelligent guy. He said, what is going on? Why are you behaving the way that you are? And he said, tell me a bit about your life. Tell me what you've gone through. I told him just what I've told you guys here today. And he went, that's it. Eureka. It's like, it, now it seems so obvious, but at the time I was so wrapped up in, in anger and trapped by the, the rage that I felt inside that I couldn't see it. And it took a barrister of all people to, to make me realize that. And I guess that really was the first step in my journey towards who I am, who I am today. And it led me to getting therapy right throughout that prison sentence. So I managed to play the, the prison system against each other and got them to pay for one-to-one -one therapy because I'm not sitting in a group with a load of other convicts in prison telling them I've been abused. Not happening. <laughs> so I had one-to-one -one therapy and strangely, that was my last offence. That was 1997 I committed that offence. Got out of prison in 1999. And I guess this is the, the second part of my journey to, to who I am today. It was the job that I got when I got out of prison. They didn't know I'd only got out of prison the day before. They didn't even know I'd been in prison. I didn't tell them. Um, and I got a job working in a, lighting, in a lighting factory just over on Mancunian Way, putting screws into floodlights, getting paid £3.25 an hour. It was not my dream job, um, but it was a job. Um, and I knew I needed to get into work, to take up my time, to stop me thinking about all my problems. Um, and it was in that job where a director there, I guess he kind of saw something in me. And in spite of the fact that I still had my issues, I was still a bit volatile, could still be a little bit aggressive, kicking off with people in the workplace and things like that. He saw something in me and he took a chance. Now, two weeks after starting there, working, putting screws in floodlights, I asked for a job in the office because I'd done a clay course in on the prison wing so I could use a computer for the first time in my life. Um, so they gave me the job in the office on a two-week trial basis and I did it for two weeks. At the end of that, they gave me the job on a permanent basis. Now, that's a big thing because at 23 years old, that was my first permanent job. You know, at 23. Long story short, 18 months later, I moved to London um, as regional sales manager for that company. Well, trainee regional sales manager for that company. I had a company car mobile phone, fuel card, and a salary that I, <laughs> I could never even dreamed of that two years before. And I guess that, as I say, that's the second step in, in the journey to who I am today. And now what I do, I go around prisons as a, as a guest speaker, talking to groups of 30 to 40 men in prison. And I believe it or not, that's much more daunting than standing here in front of you guys today. Um, and I'll tell them about my life. And at the end of it, without exception, a quarter of the guys that I speak to will come up to me at the end of it, congratulate me on being able to talk about it because they've never been able to. The same things happened to them, but they've never been able to disclose that to anyone until they've met me in on the prison wing that day. And these are guys ranging from 20 years old, I think the oldest was 61, and all the damage that's gone on in their life in that, in that time, all the damage that I would have carried on doing if that barrister hadn't asked me that question, if that employer hadn't believed in me and hadn't given me that opportunity to grow and to develop. It took someone to believe in me for me to believe in myself. So what I've done is I've set up HM Pasties, you know. Um, it's what we want to do. We want to give people that, that first step. So... Um, we're led by people with lived experience. We know what it's like to be where these people are. We've been there ourselves. We've done the hard work. We've gone through that journey. And we can support them and help them make that first step. Whilst at the same time, giving them the second step as well, that supportive employer that not only asks the right questions, but helps them to engage with services, helps them address those underlying issues, all the while helping them rebuild their lives through employment, through having a good income, giving them the training, skills, equipment that they need in order to go on and, and build a career for themselves in the food industry away from HM Pasties. So we employ people for 12 months. 
And the idea is at the end of it, people will have the skills and experience they need with the wrapped around support because it, it, it's my belief that it isn't just as simple as taking someone out of prison, giving them a house, giving them a job, and expecting all their problems to go away and expecting them never to reoffend. Because quite often what you find is someone will come out of prison, you give them a house, give them a job, on the house on their own, they haven't got the skills, they've never cooked a meal, they've not paid bills, they've not paid rent, they've not dealt with that isolation. They've now got an income, they've got bills to pay, rent to pay, money to manage, got to cook and feed and clothe themselves. They've never had to do that before. Where do they start if they haven't got that wrapped around support? And that's what we aim to offer. There are other examples where um, companies have done that and had great success. You probably all go and get keys cut somewhere. Um, there's probably about an 80% chance that your keys are being cut by someone who's come out of prison. So the Timpsons Foundation, they'll employ people on a three month training contract with Timpsons Foundation. At the end of that three months, a lot of those people who graduate that program go on to run their own Timpson branches. You know, they come out of prison, three months of support by an employer that believes in their ability to change. And guess what? They change, you know? They've got support from a mentor. So the people who work for Timpsons Foundation who support people who come out of prison, they're ex-offenders as well. Like me, they know what it's like to be where they are. And you know, I'm not a soft touch. I don't listen to any lies or anything like that. I, I tell it how it is. And I give people the opportunity to change. And they take it. And it's my belief, it's our supporters' belief that if you give people the chance to change, they will change. Um, and I guess we want to bring out the good inside and, and that's what we do. Um, and thanks for listening. <laughs>